Ever hear of something called the Jersey Devil? Yeah. It's a beast that's supposed to come out of the woods and attack cars, right? Kind of like an East Coast Bigfoot. Read the file about the case in 1947. Mulder, it's the same story I've heard since I was a kid. It's a folk tale, a myth. I heard the same story when I was a kid, too. Funny thing is, I believed it. That was, of course, the X-Files. Their Jersey Devil episode, uh, which presented the monster as a family of missing link-style human savages, was weird, but strangely significant. Uh, To understand why, we're first going to have to spend some time hanging out in the year 1909. After existing in the shadows and whispers for a century and a half or so, the Jersey Devil had a week-long coming-out party at the dawn of the 20th century. Seven spectacular days of sightings, news reports, and panic would end with a New Jersey cryptid captured and displayed alive in a museum. I'm Dylan Ferguson. I'm Sean O'Rourke. And this is The Devil You Don't. Part 3. All Mimsy or the Borogogues. It's just highly unlikely that what you're suggesting could have survived civilization or evolution out in the woods of New Jersey. It, highly unlikely, but not outside the realm of extreme possibility. <laughs> it would be an amazing discovery. So it's late night, Saturday, January 16th, 1909, in the town of Woodbury, New Jersey. A man named Thack Cousins is tottering alone out of the Woodbury Hotel bar. Pulling his coat around himself, he crunches through the fresh snow, puffs of heavy breath curdling in front of his face. Suddenly, he's stopped in his tracks. As he later told a newspaper man, I heard a hissing, and something white flew across the street. I saw two spots of phosphorus, the eyes of the beast. Later that same night, another man named John McOwens, in the nearby town of Bristol, which is actually on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River, claims that he spotted a creature after he went to comfort his infant daughter, who had awakened screaming. He recounted that, I looked from the window and was astonished to see a large creature standing on the banks of the canal. It looked something like an eagle, and it hopped along the towpath. He also heard its bizarre cries, which he said, sounded like the scratching of a phonograph before the music begins. The needle had dropped, and soon this tune would play across the region for the rest of the week, becoming almost a broken record. In the same town of Bristol, there were more run-ins with the eagle-like creature that same early morning. A police officer fired a service revolver at it, and the postmaster saw it flying through the air, over the Delaware River, and back into New Jersey. Following sunrise, multiple residents reported strange tracks in the snow in their yards. The next day, sightings seemed to be concentrated around Burlington, New Jersey, a town that you'll remember from our first episode. There, newspapers reported a real panic set again, residents barring their windows and bolting their doors, as strange tracks in the snow proliferated, sometimes appearing on the roofs of houses. Tracks also appeared in the nearby towns of Columbus, Heading, Kinkora, and Rancocas. A hunting party was organized in Jacksonville, but the hunting dogs refused to follow the trail, something that only further spooked the Jacksonvillers. On Tuesday, in Gloucester City, a paper hanger, someone who installs wallpaper for a living, and his wife claimed they watched the creature hop around on the rooftop of their shed for about 10 minutes. By this point, many newspapers in Philadelphia, the Public Ledger, the Evening Bulletin, and the press were treating the sightings as a sensation. 
That same day, two muskrat hunters announced that they trailed the beast for 20 miles before losing it. I suspect they exaggerated 20 miles. Come on. (laughs) On Wednesday, it was seen by a cop in Burlington and a spooked reverend in Pemberton. Two separate hunting parties were arranged in Haddonfield, both of which lost the tracks where their quarry apparently took flight. Another hunting party in Collingswood claimed to glimpse the devil as it took to the air. In other towns, a fisherman and a man strolling near a graveyard were startled by the creature's sudden appearance. A trolley car operator in Springside, just south of Burlington, caught it in its headlight at night, hopping across the tracks in front of his car. It appeared at the window of the Black Hawk Social Club in Camden. It circled, shrieking above a trolley stop in the same town. In Trenton, it spooked a horse and buggy and awakened a city councilman with its cries. On Thursday, it slaughtered chickens in both Bridgeton and Millville. The Philadelphia Record interviewed a lineman, not a football player, but someone who installs telegraph wires, who claims he injured the devil by shooting at it. In West Collingswood, the fire department ran the creature off by aiming a hose at it. Multiple newspapers were giving it breathless coverage by this point. The Philadelphia Press published an editorial cartoon depicting a smiling, self-satisfied Jersey Devil holding up a newspaper with a big headline that reads, All About Me. (laughs) (laughs) So, we owe this wealth of spectacular accounts, which I'm only scratching the surface of, honestly, uh, largely to the work of the writers James McCloy and Ray Miller. In their account, this is how they summarize the impact of this flurry of sightings. Quote, by sunrise Friday, the effects of the extraordinary scenes were being seen everywhere in all their emotional trauma. In the Mount Ephraim area, many people refused to leave their homes even in broad daylight. The school in town closed that day for lack of students. The absentee rate for many workers was quite high, and mills in Gloucester and Hainsport were forced to shut. A Camden theater canceled a performance. The drivers of trolleys in Trenton and New Brunswick were apparently given arms so they could protect themselves in case of attack. This brief wealth of reports might have languished in the archives if it wasn't for the great work of McCloy and Miller, who poured over newspapers from 1909 to reconstruct a day-by-day, almost hour-by-hour account of this one week in January. Their research was published as the centerpiece of their 1976 book, The Jersey Devil. This work remains the definitive Jersey Devil book, with like textbook status in the world of cryptozoology. As the Jersey folklorist Angus Cress Gillespie wrote about the Jersey Devil in his foreword to the volume's follow-up, The Phantom of the Pines, from 1998, It has found its way into nearly every library in the state and is widely used by teachers, librarians, and school children. Whenever the topic of the Jersey Devil comes up, people refer to the book by McCloy and Miller. Admittedly, uh, cryptozoology texts exist in a corner of the publishing industry bloated with dubious, raggedy, poorly sourced, and questionably written books. But even though McCloy and Miller's volume is a little meandering and unstructured and sometimes maybe a bit dopey and credulous, these writers deserve tons of credit for their meticulous and super fun reconstruction of newspaper accounts from 1909. They even produce hand-drawn maps tracking the improbable peregrinations of the beast. It's a legitimately awesome historical excavation of what they call the phenomenal week. And since that term, the phenomenal week, is such a great coinage, I'm happy to use it in their honor. Okay, so now that we finally have a bundle of alleged eyewitness sightings to draw from, we can ask the question that I'm sure a lot of you are pondering. What exactly does the Jersey Devil look like? Sean, what does the Jersey Devil look like in your mind? Um, I'm picturing like three to four feet high, a uh, weird furry guy with wings. Uh, or at least traditionally, that is what I would picture. Um, certain other sources have put other images uh, in my brain. Like, for example, a, a big titty Bigfoot is one hypothesis <laughs> that's put put forward. Um, but I, I think I generally default to like a, a weird little guy. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, no, that's like um, a lot of the, the qualities that you just mentioned are things that we've already seen in like the couple accounts that we encountered the previous episode. Mm-hmm. Um, we've already seen accounts that describe what we might call like the canonical attributes. Uh, bipedal stance, horse's head, often serpent's tail, and bat wings. Uh, as I suggested at the end of the first episode, it's possible that this depiction might have been influenced by the cockatrice, a uh, wyvern or mythical monster rooster that was depicted on the Leeds family crest, as reproduced on the cover of the Leeds Almanac in the time of Titan's stewardship. But many accounts don't conform to this image at all. Here is an incomplete list of a few of the different ways the Jersey Devil has been described. George Snyder, the fisherman who was surprised by the devil, said that it was three feet high, long black hair over its entire body, arms and hands like a monkey, face like a dog, split hooves, and a tail a foot long. So sightings of something ape-like or hairy are more common than you might expect. Another one, uh, it was the size of a small pony with a head somewhat like a horse, but its body was very long and it had a shaggy fur coat. That sounds a lot like the Simpsons bit about the horse with the head of a rabbit and the body of a rabbit. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. It's like... (laughs) I think you just saw a long pony, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) About the size of a pony, but with the head of a horse. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Weird. Uh, A 1927 eyewitness said it stood upright like a man, but without clothing and covered with hair. The Erie Railroad engineer in 1893 said, in an account we already encountered, the face was like that of an ape or monkey. So maybe it's actually like a Bigfoot kind of thing. Uh, But hold on, a railroad worker who saw it in broad daylight said it had skin like an alligator. Others saying it resembled a crane, eagle, or ostrich seemed to imply it had feathers. One Trenton resident split the difference, describing a beast of fur and feathers. Another man referred to it as a glowing red thing. Accounts depicting it as a sort of upright ungulate are common. Mrs. Ed Shingle of White City said, It's a two-legged cow with wings. But generally people compare it to a horse instead of a cow. Hank White, one of the two muskrat hunters who trailed it for an improbable length of time, declared it to be an air hoss and said he knew those because he's from Georgia. Here we can see a little bit of folkloric cross-pollination because the flying horse called the air hoss, usually spelt H-O-S-S, reflecting the regional pronunciation of horse, is a lesser known cryptid tradition from the American Southeast. The presence of wings, sometimes feathery, usually leathery, are extremely common, though not necessary. As for its head, the Bristol postmaster said it resembled that of a ram with curled horns. But an eyewitness in Swedesboro insisted that it had antlers like a moose. Most agree that it is bipedal, though as we've seen, it's usually depicted as hopping, not walking. But there are also accounts of a four-legged devil, sometimes resembling a demonic dog. These might represent a blurring of the lines between the Leeds Devil and another Pines legend, the Black Dog. Some claim to have encountered an aquatic Jersey Devil out at sea. One sailor said it was like an alligator, another that it had eight flexible arms like an octopus. And how big is it? So as we've seen, many of the phenomenal weak sightings describe something surprisingly small, maybe just three feet tall, like you said, Sean. But others describe a being six feet tall or more. A man named Leslie Garrison said it had legs five or six feet long, stretched horizontally, and at the extremities were feet which resembled a man's. Probably the most exaggerated sighting claims that it was 20 feet tall and was seen cutting the tops off trees. In 1911, a Pennsylvania fish breeder announced that he had discovered a live Jersey Devil in his aquarium. It was two inches long. All right, so it's it's all over the fucking map, in other words. <laughs> yeah, this is just every every animal. <laughs> yeah, and this is common to some extent in cryptozoology, right? Just having a bunch of accounts that contradict one another while claiming to be of the same creature. Uh, but with the Jersey Devil especially, which has no equivalent of the surgeon's photograph of the Loch Ness Monster 
or the Patterson Gimlin film of the Bigfoot, uh, no signature piece of photographic media to use as a point of reference. Uh, there's kind of nothing to stop eyewitness accounts from spiraling out of control. If there's one most iconic representation of the Jersey Devil, it's an illustration that appeared in the Philadelphia Bulletin during the phenomenal week of 1909. It's a sort of emaciated horse standing upright while wearing a kind of mischievous expression with bat wings and a long slender tail with a forked tip. There were a lot of illustrations of the devil that appeared in newspapers during that week, but if this one in particular was seized upon by the cryptid community, well, it's probably because the others are intentionally goofy, which <laughs> I'm getting to that. So if we take it at face value that at least some of the people who have called in sighting saw an actual something is there an animal we could possibly use to explain or debunk at least a few of these? Is there an equivalent of the seals in the Loch Ness or the barn owls with their glowing eyes, which are often invoked by debunkers? Speculating about real animals behind sightings is a tradition in crypto research, so uh, let's deal with this very quickly. Uh, if you've ever encountered a YouTube video with a title like, Is This the Jersey Devil Caught on Tape? and it's like trail cam footage of glowing eyes in the woods, you're probably looking at a deer. There's lots of those in South Jersey. Uh, there's also a good deal of black bears, and some of the accounts of shaggy, shuffling chicken eaters sound suspiciously bear-like to me. But if there's one species that gets invoked most frequently as a real Jersey Devil solution by those who insist on trying to match an animal to a myth, it's actually a bird. The sandhill crane, Antigone catadensis, one of the largest birds in the Americas and one of the most ancient birds in the world, is sometimes trotted out at Jersey Devil conventions as the ultimate solution. Uh, this strikes me as a little silly, since it's not even a species you can historically expect to find in New Jersey. But sure, some of these people uh, maybe saw a large bird in low visibility circumstances. Uh, though I feel it's more likely they saw like an actually local species, like a great blue heron or a bald eagle. I feel like calling it a bird is just uh, stealing valor from the Mothman. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and Mothman often gets called a, a barn owl, too. That's like the classic yeah, like debunker solution for that. Yeah. Okay, so to return to the newspaper reports, one thing to note is that the phenomenal week is the point... When our, uh, when our boy began to undergo a rebrand. As I've mentioned uh, all throughout his history until now, the creature was referred to as the Leeds Devil. In the first episode, we learned the story of how the Leeds family name became attached to monstrosity. Now on January 21st, 1909, the Trenton Times becomes probably the first newspaper to use the new version, publishing the phrase, the mysterious Jersey Devil is surely in this neighborhood. Most newspapers were still using the traditional name, the Leeds Devil, but as accounts spread and exploded in number, they began calling it a bunch of different things. It was sometimes called the Flying Hoof, a name which also appears in that same Trenton Times article. The Flying Death was another moniker it got stuck with, a little unfairly to me, since it didn't seem to be killing anyone beyond an occasional chicken. Other articles call it the prehistoric lizard, or the cowbird, or winged dog. Well, as we've already seen, it could be called an air horse or air hoss. More bizarre names the newspapers dreamed up include the kingo wing, the woozlebug, and the jersey what is it. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's a good one. That's the more formal version of the what's it. That's the newspaper version, yeah. Right. A surprisingly large number of newspapers refer to it as the Jabberwocky or Jabberwock. Hmm. Yeah, so, like, hold up. Record scratch. <laughs> the Jabberwocky. That term, it's like hitting something in my brain that is asking, like, I'm a, should I feel uncomfortable with that term? <laughs> yeah, wait, it, you know where this comes from, right? No, I don't. Or is, it just, is it ringing a bell and you're not sure where that bell is? Yeah, I, I, I uh, don't quite know what it's hitting, but there's something there. It's Lewis Carroll. 
Uh, it's the nonsense poem that he includes in Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass, which right. is just one of the greatest books ever written, in my opinion, published in 1871. So it's the poem uh, full of like goofy made up words. Uh, it starts okay. with "Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves and the mome wreaths outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. <laughs> okay, so that's delightful. Um, I just have a thing Absolutely. where when I don't know a weird old word, I have to ask myself, wait, is this going to be a racist thing? <laughs> <laughs> is this going to be something that like my grandma might say out of pocket? Yeah, yeah. When there's a weird invented word that sounds old, it's like, okay, is it Shakespeare, Lewis Carroll, or racists? Yeah. That's probably <laughs> one of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad we're in the clear for this one. <laughs> so, all right, let's pause on this then. Why would breathless accounts of a scary creature terrorizing isolated communities be getting mixed up with this patently silly pop culture reference? And I think in 1909, it's fair to call Alice in Wonderland still a relatively contemporary pop culture reference. Mm -hmm. The Philadelphia Public Ledger article titled Jabberwock in Mortal Combat even <laughs> features a nearly full page illustration that's just a faithful replica of John Tenniel's famous illustration of the fantastical being from Through the Looking Glass. The caption to this illustration reads, Fearsome creature, as depicted in modern literature, the counterpart of which, many say, is causing terror in portions of South Jersey. Wow. Oh. Of course, you could say that the creature from modern literature was never fearsome so much as intentionally ridiculous. The subject of a bit of chuckling sport is the work of a talented writer jesting with old Englishy sounds to produce a poetic chronicle that feels vaguely like some ancient tract you dissect in university, but is really complete and utter nonsense. Lewis Carroll, in writing a nonsense poem that appears full of elusive import, was showing how words can feel rich with meaning, even as the text signifies nothing, or else that words can signify nothing and still produce a text rich with meaning, or maybe those are both the same thing. You could almost say that there are echoes of Daniel Leeds, not intentionally, of course, but the staunch advocate of publishing and lover of writing who nonetheless insisted that words couldn't capture truth um, might have had a lot to discuss with Carroll. Anyway, the invocation of Lewis Carroll in these articles is, to me, clearly a way to make fun of the content. That public ledger article that reproduces the Tennille illustration recounts a story that mostly sounds serious on the face of it, until we get to an account of the Jersey Jabberwock crossing the tram lines, where an unnamed witness, quote, said he thought he saw it dancing a jig on the third rail. <laughs> <laughs> he is a weird little guy. So something else is clearly going on in these stories. Something that's not being addressed in McCloy and Miller's 1976 text. It's hard not to snicker when you come across passages in the book The Jersey Devil, like this one. Three prominent New Jerseyites speculated about the Jersey Devil. J.K. Hewitt, a naturalist of the 500 block of Chestnut Street in Camden, declared without doubt that the beast was a jabberwock. <laughs> like, not once do McCloy and Miller in their whole book ever mention Lewis Carroll or Alice in Wonderland or show any indication that they're even aware that what they faithfully transcribe as an alternate taxonomic designation is actually a literary reference and a pretty goofy one that's presumably being made with tongue in cheek. Maybe they thought it was a racial thing too. <laughs> they were playing it safe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so look, the Jersey devil uh, the book, as well as McCloy and Miller's 1998 follow-up, The Phantom of the Pines. Uh, these are really cool books. I was really grateful for these kind of cryptozoology books growing up and revisiting some of them. I still am. They rule. They're really cool. Uh, Sean, did you read cryptozoology books like when you were growing up? No, not really. Um, I think a lot of... Um... 
like in the nineties, a lot of the sort of like Fox TV style, maybe hosted by Jonathan Frakes, like mm. little special documentary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, the same universe as Unsolved Mysteries or Alien Autopsy. I don't remember reading a lot of, about cryptids as a kid, though. Yeah, uh, for me, definitely when I was like starting to go to the library, that was like one of the things I would do was get like cryptozoology books. The Tim Dinsdale books about the Loch Ness Monster were like formative for me. I just think it's so cool to read or to watch series about these people who like so earnestly yearn for and search for the the mysteries of the world. And if these books are often like meandering and bizarrely structured and very sloppily sourced, that's it's all part of their charm. It's part of the fun. There's like a romance to that kind of quest. Absolutely. Yeah. There's something that almost connects it to like in the older world of discovery and wonder. Yeah. But So here's the thing, though. I tracked down scans as as many of the 1909 newspaper articles that McCloy and Miller reference as I possibly could. And I can say that while they definitely faithfully recount specific details in their genuinely lovely rendition of the phenomenal week, which I appreciate so much, what they fail to capture is the tone of the articles they're citing. Because so many of these pieces are clearly written with an edge of derisive irony. And McCloy and Miller, whether by intent or because they failed to pick up on it, almost never mention that. The authors of the most authoritatively well-researched Jersey Devil books, which I referenced in episode one, Brian Regal and Frank J. Esposito's The Secret History of the Jersey Devil, and Bill Sprouse's delightful The Domestic Life of the Jersey Devil, are not without admiration for McCloy and Miller's work themselves. But they also can't resist taking little jibes at their credulity. Uh, Sprouse, who is a proud owner of a battered copy of the Jersey Devil, who attends conventions where McCloy and Miller hold court and examine a caged sandhill crane, is mostly gentle on them. But he can't help but suggest of their seminal portrait of statewide panic during the phenomenal week, and of sources like Wikipedia that have dutifully followed in their footsteps that, quote, while statements like this may get the words right, they seem to get the music wrong. <laughs> Regal and Esposito are a little more bruising. Uh, they write that this area of study was, quote, invigorated by the publication of McCloy and Miller's The Jersey Devil, 1978. The book was full of fantastic stories and had no irksome footnotes, citations, or other historical scholarly baggage to get in the way of the fun. <laughs> And I can't help but point out that The Jersey Devil was actually published in 1976, not 1978. So if you're going to be snobbish mm. about inaccurate information, Regal and Exposito, you might want to do a tidier job. Yeah, they're going to get dragged in the quote tweets. <laughs> well, so while some of the newspaper accounts do seem to be more or less on the level, so many of them slip into snarky commentary. Some of them do so very obviously, presenting sarcastic pseudoscientific information like, quote, the monster, aka South Jersey's what is it, could fly, swim, eat hay, chew cud, and lay red, white, and blue eggs. Also, <laughs> they were explosive, the eggs. Full moon bursts them so the thing makes its nest in extinct craters. <laughs> <laughs> That's really solid comedy writing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, others were a little more subtle in their mockery, uh, slipping in sly lines like, So uncanny is the mystery that many persons who do not know the word superstition, after careful study of the marks, are willing to ascribe them to some supernatural cause. <laughs> uh, as you can maybe tell by now, a common theme is mocking the intelligence of the eyewitnesses. Uh, as I already mentioned, the residents of the South Jersey Pine Barrens, sneeringly referred to as Pineys, were generally seen as slow-witted, inbred, drunk, and degenerate. And so these newspaper accounts, often written for a readership in Philadelphia, enjoy pretending to transmit the slovenly speech of the backwoods locals, quoting lines like, And I ain't a gwine out no more without my gun. <laughs> uh, that same article I just uh, awfully quoted features a cartoon of a devil as an apparition billowing out of an uncorked bottle. There's a slovenly spectator slumped against a wall with a speech bubble saying, it's been a year since I seen them things. Never again for me. 
references to moonshine consumption are rampant, with multiple articles coyly claiming it has been a bumper year for Jersey Applejack. One otherwise straight-faced account ends with the obviously sarcastic sentence, Strange to say, this animal has been seen only by those men of Haddon Township who are well known to be total abstainers and who recently opposed the delivering of intoxicating liquors through their towns. More blatantly, the Philadelphia Evening World reported, with evident disgust, on, quote, a multitude of hot-scented, weird, lurid, hallucinatory, (laughs) phantasmagoric, and preternatural descriptions of the thing that is loose in the Applejack Belt of South Jersey and the Schnapps District of Pennsylvania. The Schnapps District? (laughs) I want to hang out in the Schnapps District. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds awesome. (laughs) Is that part of Philly? I hope so. (laughs) I hope it still exists. Man, rents are really going up in the Schnapps District lately. (laughs) (laughs) It's all gentrified now. There's not even a Wawa there. (laughs) Similarly disapproving in tone is an editorial cartoon that depicts... Actually, you know what, Sean? I'm going to send this one to you. Okay. Hold on a second. Because you're going to want to see this one. All right. I'm excited. All right, here we go. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right, dude, tell me what you're seeing here. <laughs> I, okay. So it's a, a big jug, like a, like, a, like a growl or a beer, like a liquor jug, with uh, bat wings. And um, the, it sort of has the head and neck of a bird made out of a corkscrew, r- removing the cork of the body of the jug. It has uh, two legs of like a horse like with the the knee going the other way and um it's casting a shadow over um the words earthquake and then uh the figures of what looked to be teddy roosevelt uh william is it william howard taft congress all of congress and does that say tariff on the yeah. someone with, with a top hat yeah i think it's just a guy labeled tariff <laughs> and then the the it's captioned it's sort of like um like a new yorker style overshadowed <laughs> right so i i take this to mean this uh this awful goofy boozy scourge is taking away from all the real news that uh, of the time Right, I think that's a pretty clear reading of that right like mm-hmm. enough of this bullshit we all know it's a bunch of drunks telling stories so let's not let it get in the way of real news, like Tariff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the Holly Smoot fiasco. Yeah. <laughs> it also bears mentioning that some of these articles make just condescending racist reference to how all the Negroes in town are in a state of dumb panic. Hmm. And so many of the illustrations accompanying the stories are blatantly facetious, depicting the Leeds Devil as an absurd, fantastic being, sometimes wearing a top hat holding a balloon, or smoking a cigar. (laughs) And something else caught my eye, too. Something I haven't seen commented on in any other sources. A couple articles make apparently sarcastic reference to something called nature fakers. One mentions some strange animal not as yet classified by scientist or nature faker. Another report concludes with a line... There was an excellent chance for a nature faker to do some sleuthing on the mystery. So I'd never heard this term before, nature faker. Had you ever heard this before, Sean? No, I've never come across it. It sounds like a band. <laughs> what kind of band? Um, it, it, I don't know, it sounds like an indie band that would call themselves a post-hardcore band that I would see second on a bill and think, okay, I'm not going to leave the room. This is fine. All right. Yeah. Uh, So, I mean, I decided to do a little sleuthing on the mystery myself, uh, because these authors seem to be dropping some kind of hint they expected their audience to pick up on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned about a very interesting literary controversy in early 1900s America that is, in fact, known as the Nature Faker Controversy. So I mentioned in the previous episode that in the years following the Civil War, literary America began to become obsessed with nature. An idea seeded by men like Emerson and Thoreau had become enlarged upon by men like John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt, and the romantic notion of stout American men 
exploring and revering healthy, hardy, capital N nature had become something of a national obsession. The federal government began to establish national parks, and an expanded railroad network, as well as the continued subjugation of the First Nations, whose resistance to Euro-American attempts to control the continent's vast interior was crumbling, uh, made it newly possible for more city dwellers to visit these wild areas for themselves. And as a result of this nature boom, the late 1800s saw an explosion of American essays and books about wildlife. In the March 1903 issue of our old friend, The Atlantic Monthly, there appeared an essay by the American naturalist John Burroughs, where he called foul on this trend. Uh, As we've seen from looking at their June 1859 issue in the previous episode, The Atlantic, which was still at the forefront of American letters, had helped incite the new wave of nature writing in the first place. Burroughs' Atlantic piece was titled, Real and sham natural history. Um, I, uh, you you check this out, right, Sean? I, I sent you this just before we started recording. Yeah, I, I really like this piece actually. It's, it's a really good illustration of like the, how the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because it reads just like something I would pull up on Substack these days of like someone <laughs> shitting on Elon Musk or debunking AI or something. It's just like it's a really delicious critique. Um, let's just uh, quickly dip our toes in. The growing demand for nature books within the past few years has called forth a very large crop of these books, good, bad, and indifferent. Books on our flowers, our birds, our animals, our butterflies, our ferns, our trees. Books of animal stories, animal romances, nature study books, and whatnot. There is a long list of them. So what bothered Burroughs was that some of these writers were clearly exploiting the public's thirst for colorful romantic tales at the expense of rigorous observation. Uh, He's annoyed that too many of these writers have succumbed to, to what he calls the danger of making too much of what we see and describe, of putting in too much sentiment, too much literature. In short, of valuing these things more for the literary effects we can get out of them than for themselves. So remember, America never stopped being a society, uh, in the cities anyway, that was obsessed with science, or at least the idea of science. As described earlier, going back to the years leading up to the revolution, many Americans saw this devotion to Enlightenment values and strict rationalism as what set them apart, what made their society great. And as the nature boom continued to expand, some essayists were voicing concern that the gooey romanticism of the movement was drawing literate Americans too far from the right path, that they were becoming too idealistic and gullible. What if the public's love of mountains and moose was a Trojan horse allowing woo-woo shit to creep back in? Burroughs in his essay points to a bunch of dubious observations claimed in recent popular nature books by writers like Ernest Thompson Seton and William J. Long. Some of them describe impossibly clever animal strategies and unrealistically noble, self-sacrificing behavior. Sean, let's hear a little bit more from, uh, from fuming Mr. Bureaus. I am bound to say that the line between fact and fiction is repeatedly crossed, and that a deliberate attempt is made to induce the reader to cross too and to work such a spell upon him that he shall not know that he has crossed and is in the land of make-believe. Mr. Thompson Seaton says in capital letters that his stories are true, and it is this emphatic assertion that makes the judicious grieve. True as romance, true in their artistic effects, true in their power to entertain the young reader, they certainly are. But true as natural history, they as certainly are not. For example, Burroughs focuses obsessively on an anecdote in Charles G.D. Roberts' popular book, Kindred of the Wild, where the author claims to have witnessed a porcupine curl up into a ball and roll away. I question his right to make his porcupine roll himself into a ball when attacked. I have tried all sorts of tricks with the porcupine and made all sorts of assaults upon him at different times, and I have never yet seen him assume the globular form Mr. Roberts describes. 
he's he's right. Like North American porcupines don't roll into balls. Yeah, that's that's Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> yeah, but also, what the fuck has this man been doing to porcupines? <laughs> <laughs> I want I want to know exactly what sorts of assaults have been made upon him. <laughs> this guy is fucking jigsaw for porcupines. <laughs> Uh, Anyway, he concludes that even if these writings have the education of the public at heart, they end up becoming a poison because their mock natural history is misleading the minds of many readers. No pleasure to the reader, no moral inculcated can justify the dissemination of false notions of nature or of anything else. Right. So what matters, in other words, is the pursuit of truth. Pure, hard truth, and this obsession with nature writing might be leading Americans further from it, not closer to it. So this essay actually really struck a nerve. Apparently, many Americans were delighted to hear a prominent naturalist say what they were thinking. Suddenly, nature writers were under attack, denounced as frauds, while others tried valiantly to defend their honor against the scientific hardliners. But the defenders were losing. The controversy reached ahead in 1907, when Everybody's Magazine published an essay by no less a figure than Theodore Roosevelt weighing in on the question. As mentioned, Teddy Roosevelt had been hugely influential in popularizing the nature boom in the first place. The child of wealthy Manhattan socialites, born sickly with severe asthma, Roosevelt believed that he found his manly medal by forcing himself to live rough on the frontier, and his swashbuckling accounts of hunting bison in the Dakota Territory in the 1880s had made him a popular romantic figure for the American public. And by 1907, he was more than just a famous writer, of course. He was President of the United States, a popular second-term president at that. Despite having done his fair share of romanticizing nature in his day, Roosevelt was a friend and admirer of John Burroughs, and he came down firmly on his side. His article was simply titled, Nature Fakers. And while he wrote, I know that as president, I ought not to do this, (laughs) the literary equivalent (laughs) of, somebody hold me back. (laughs) He rolled up his presidential sleeves and tore into many of the same writers Burroughs had targeted who had been struggling to defend themselves ever since. He called their works unnatural history. Ooh. Fucking roasted their asses. Yeah, boom. <laughs> and an object of derision to every scientist worthy of the name, to every real lover of the wilderness, to every faunal naturalist, to every true hunter or nature lover. He also took the opportunity to berate Jack London, uh, whose anthropomorphized <laughs> wolf stories like White Fang he hated. And he added, as for the matter of giving these books to children for the purpose of teaching them the facts of natural history, why, it's an outrage. Roosevelt's uh, way of teaching children natural history was just to, like, keep raccoons around the White House and stuff, right? (laughs) Wait, is that a real thing? I, I think, yeah, I think Roosevelt had, like, a bunch of weird pets. One of the, or the 20th century ones had a raccoon. Um, But Roosevelt, I think, had, like, a bunch of, you know non-standard dog and cat type things i mean that seems to fit his character yeah so like it was basically over at that point the nation's beloved president a famous nature lover had shown up to clown on the romantic novelistic nature writers taking the side of the hardline scientists who wanted to preserve rigor and unsparing rationalism There were aftershocks, of course, and the writers, now forever branded as nature fakers, didn't go down without a fight. William J. Long, whom Burroughs had savaged and who had since become the leader of the defense, continued to bluster against the president's incursion, voicing his anger that everyone was letting Roosevelt, famously a hunter of animals, tell Americans how they can and cannot talk about animals. Writing in the New York Times in response to Roosevelt's piece, Long fumed that, quote, every time he gets near the heart of a wild thing, he invariably puts a bullet through it. Writing in the Philadelphia Public Ledger shortly before that same newspaper would take center stage publishing Jersey Devil stories, Long added, 
Roosevelt is a man who takes savage delight in whooping through the woods, killing everything in sight. But as protests aside, he'd lost. Which isn't to say that he didn't kind of have a point. Uh, Roosevelt's frontier mindset saw animals as fascinating but subordinate things uh, placed on this earth to serve and feed us. And ultimately, the hard-edged version of science that America had taken as her religion had always preferred that view. The nature writers Burroughs mocked and savaged had actually, obviously, just invented a bunch of their so-called observations. He wasn't wrong to say that they were doing a disservice to their field. They were. But at the same time, it seems like the conclusion of the nature faker controversy kind of ended up being just like hard, ruthless rationalism, beating down and flexing over the prone body of a more imaginative strain of new American romanticism. And there's something sad about that, too. So let's circle back to the phenomenal week. Here we are, about a year and a half after Roosevelt published his article, bringing this nature faker controversy to a head, and we see these anonymous newspaper writers snarkily invoking those maligned nature fakers as they write their scoffing summaries of alleged mysterious happenings in the woods. Something has changed a little from the more odd, credulous sense of wonder in the rare newspaper accounts of the Leeds Devil from the 1880s and 1890s, which we encountered earlier. We mentioned then that there was always a kind of tension between American reverence for the beautiful, healthy woodlands as they were now being conceived, and a disgust for the people who actually lived in the woods. Now the irrepressible muscle of American rationalism was clapping firmly back at the wishy-washy shit that had taken tenuous hold in the late 1800s. These articles about the Leeds Devil uh, may have been catering to a genuine public fascination with mysterious things, but actually reading the accounts, it becomes obvious how many of the writers were taking the opportunity to not only belittle people they saw as slack-jawed yokels, but to also belittle anyone who had ever believed those once popular accounts about how the natural world is full of magic and wonder. So is this the whole story of what actually motivated the flurry of newspaper accounts that constitute the phenomenal week? Not quite, no. All right, so I did, after all, tease that the Jersey Devil was captured, didn't I? Yeah, held live. So let's talk about how the phenomenal week came to an end. Several posses and hunting parties in different towns had been organized to track, kill, or capture the elusive devil. Some museums and zoos got in on the action, too. The Philadelphia Zoo offered $10,000 to anyone who could capture a devil corresponding to descriptions in the press. Wait, is that $10,000 like 1909 money? Yeah, in, in their money. Holy moly. Yeah. I don't even think the inflation calculator goes back that far. <laughs> That's, that's like pre-Federal Reserve. Sorry, anyway. <laughs> uh, another institution that was very interested was the Ninth and Arch Dime Museum in Philadelphia. And on Friday, January 22nd, 1909, a week after the wave of sightings kicked off, and after news reports had mostly abated, a hunting party organized by this museum headed off into the woods to capture the beast. Well, actually, it sounds like they might have just headed off into a park in Philadelphia. But in any event, when the hunters emerged, after a flurry of shouts and screams, they were carrying a rattling covered cage. The Jersey Devil, they announced, had finally been captured. And tomorrow, he was going to be put on display in the museum. (laughs) 
at the risk of a little bit of crossover here, um, is this the genesis of another famous Jersey on display song that we might be familiar with? I'm not sure I know what you're referring to. I'd be honest. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name. Is it one of the Jersey housewives have a song called on display? <laughs> oh yeah. Melissa Gorga, I think. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Like early oh, Jersey housewife. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to put in a, a 10 seconds or less clip of that in here. All right. So Sean, I'm going to send you another document here. Okay. I want you to take a look at this. Oh my goodness. Uh, there's a lot of exclamation points on here. I mean, of course the content is absolutely phenomenal. Wait, yeah, wait, yeah it, it's sensational. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So so tell me what you're looking at. Uh so it it's um like a an advertisement for the exhibition from the Ninth and Arch Museum. Well, at the very top is caught and here alive. Um <laughs> that's three exclamation points at each of those breaks. Yeah. Uh then we have like a rather friendly little cartoon. Um Yeah, he doesn't look very hostile. No, like a classic weird little guy, bipedal, kind of short T-Rex arms. It has an almost smiling horseish head and, and bat wings and a little devil tail. It it really looks quite friendly, like it's coming to ask me for an ice cream. Um, <laughs> but it says, yeah, the Leeds Devil captured Friday after a terrific struggle. Exhibited exclusively here at say $1,000 a week. I'm not sure what that's else. referring to, actually. The fearful, frightful, ferocious monster, which has been terrorizing two states, swims, flies, gallops. Uh, I'm loving how exclamatory this is. Oh, yeah. Exhibited securely chained in a massive steel cage, a living dragon more fearsome than the fabled monsters of mythology. Don't miss the sight of a lifetime. Big string of sensations in Curio Hall. 10 cents admits to all. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, pretty intriguing. Yeah, that's a really solid poster. Like, I want to go see it. Oh, yeah. And I want that poster on my wall, actually. <laughs> well, oh, it's actually, yeah. so it's not a poster. This is actually a playbill. Um, right. This is a playbill for, of course, the Philadelphia Ninth and Arch Dime Museum. And the first thing you need to know is that the term museum could be used pretty loosely in turn of the century America. The Ninth and Arch was a big, beautiful three-story building with a colorfully painted facade on a corner in downtown Philly built in the mid-1800s. It was owned by an impresario named Charles A. Bradenburg, and for the admittance fee of, yes, one dime, which is the equivalent of roughly four bucks today, uh, you were granted access to a panoply of wonders. So on the first floor, there were apparatuses for testing strength. And on the second floor, there were cages of animals like monkeys and prairie dogs. But the real shit happened up on the third floor, which housed an auditorium, where you could catch acts like Lalu, the Chinese acrobat, or the human bat, as well as like illusionists and glass eaters. And once every hour, they'd put on their version of a popular play, condensed down to a 40-minute summary. Also, starting in the 1890s, the museum experimented with screening motion pictures, effectively becoming one of Philadelphia's first movie theaters. Not too bad for a dime. Yeah, you can't even get a coffee for four bucks. But despite all this, the museum was struggling financially in 1909. But Bradenburg had recently hired a promotions man who had an idea. This was Norman Jeffries a guy in his early 40s who used to be a journalist. Shortly after the devil stories began to appear in 1909, Jeffries sat down with his new boss and convinced Bradenburg that what this place really needed was to get the Jersey Devil captured and put on display, one way or another. So here's the real story behind that playbill. Jeffries and Bradenburg contacted a local taxidermist named Jacob Hope and asked him where they could get their hands on a weird creature that might suit their purposes. Hope reached out to a sketchy animal trainer he knew in Buffalo, a man who went by Professor Edwards, and this self-styled mm -hmm. professor arranged to send them a kangaroo. 
God knows where this guy got a kangaroo in the first place. The hunting party that captured the beast, it turns out, was entirely staged with hired performers. The man who played the lead hunter was a Ringling Brothers circus clown wearing a costume. (laughs) And so, following the publicity stunt, on Monday, January 24th, 1909, the curtain went up to a packed house in the Ninth and Arch. Jeffries had distributed playbills like the one you just saw all over town. And he had gotten notices printed in as many newspapers as he could. What the audience was treated to once the curtain rose was a confused and frightened kangaroo that had been painted with green stripes and had a pair of fake copper wings attached to its back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Additionally, the poor marsupial merely slumped in a corner as the Philadelphians gawked at it. Bradenburg realized he needed to get it to do more, so he had a little hole drilled in that corner of the enclosure, and a boy was hired to hide behind a curtain with a sharp stick and occasionally poke the kangaroo through the hole, causing it to yelp and hop around a little bit each time. (laughs) That's so sad. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jersey Devil. It's not clear how many people actually went to see the show, but some contemporary reports say thousands. And descriptions of the beast as being kangaroo-like definitely seem to increase immediately after this. So I think it left a bit of an impression. But the box office receipts apparently weren't enough for Bradenburg, as he was forced to close the Ninth and Arch Dime Museum just a few weeks later. Jeffries would go on to work in vaudeville promotion, and eventually he produced some one-reel silent films in the 1920s. That beautiful three-story building became a minstrel theater for a while, and today there's a parking lot where it once stood. Oh, that's even sadder than the kangaroo. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what happened to the kangaroo, unfortunately. (laughs) The truth is, though, that Norman Jeffrey's ploy didn't start when they bought a kangaroo. The former journalist was well known to the newspaper men of Philadelphia. And there's good evidence that in the days leading up to the kangaroo stunt, in fact, throughout the phenomenal week, Jeffrey's had been working as contacts, planting stories in the press about the Jersey Devil, fueling the phenomenon. So, Here's another thing that needs to be mentioned about the press coverage that forms the basis for this celebrated week. Not only should we keep in mind that many of these articles were actually kind of mocking in tone, their writers softly letting their eyes roll and tongues slip into cheek, but let's also remember that American journalism circa 1909 was famously not very reliable. Uh, This was the age of yellow journalism, when newspapers were often full of stories that were exaggerated, dubious, or bought and paid for. America at the turn of the century was in the Gilded Age, a term coined by Mark Twain for a period of great wealth and expansion, which followed the difficult period of reconstruction and urbanization after the Civil War. And newspapers exploded during the Gilded Age. There was just a mind-numbing array of newspaper options being cranked out by printing presses in every town and every region. Telegraph wires and railroads now crisscrossed the nation, allowing news and physical papers to travel quickly and easily, and people now had more disposable income and an appetite for current events. As a side note, the rise of the Gilded Age can also partially maybe explain why the nature boom was losing some of its sheen. Uh, Wilderness seemed most attractive when the cities were overcrowded and grim, as they tended to be during the lean Reconstruction years. Now, though there was certainly still a lot of poverty and income inequality was extreme, there was greater upward mobility and a rise in urban development underwritten by swelling tax coffers, so the cities uh, weren't quite so bad anymore. But to get back to my point, uh, this meant lots of newspapers, lots of competition between newspapers, lots of incentive to publish anything that might boost sales. Publishers pushed their editors to run anything sensational, and reporters at the time were famous for their loose principles. Anecdotally, you could get just about anything published by slipping a writer a bottle of whiskey. Looking over these newspaper accounts of the devil, 
the hallmarks of yellow journalism are all over them. Often the witnesses aren't named at all. They'd vaguely attribute these stories to local people or old-timers or Negroes. There may be a few accounts from the Phenomenal Week that are genuine. Perhaps this postmaster or that constable really did see something that spooked them. But I think they're definitely outnumbered by accounts that are pure invention. Whole cloth fabrication. Bullshit. And it appears that at least some of these bullshit accounts were written and run at the request of Norman Jeffries. Calling in a favor from an old friend, maybe. Maybe showing up with a bottle of schnapps to grease the wheels of invention. (laughs) At one point, as he was planning the climax of his publicity stunt, Jeffries even decided to give the Jersey Devil a new origin story. A piece in the Philadelphia Inquirer, which he surely planted, from January 22nd, the day he had set for the Devil's staged capture, claimed that the mysterious beast was, in fact, a creature known as an Australian vampire. (laughs) The article reported that the Ninth and Arch Museum had imported this zoological wonder before it escaped, and they were now undertaking to recapture it. Other, more principled newspapers were not amused by the gag. When the Ninth and Arch announced their new attraction, the New York Times which had staunchly refused to buy into the whole Jersey Devil story, posted a sour article announcing that the gig was up. The headline was, South Jersey Joke Ended. And it was a small bulletin in the Times of Saturday, January 23rd, the day after the capture was announced. It begins, quote, The press agent for an animal dealer who is responsible for the tales of the Australian vampire devil or whatever it is, which have been coming from all parts of South Jersey for two weeks, ended the joke today by announcing that the thing had been captured and put back in its cage in the blank museum. (laughs) So I love the way they redact the museum's name, stubbornly refusing (laughs) to give any further publicity to a stunt that they find uh, very much pas drôle. The elite New York Times. Yeah. So how much of the phenomenal week was the result of Norman Jeffries planting stories on behalf of Bradenburg's museum? That's probably impossible to determine. But it does seem that the stories about the Leeds Devil's reappearance began organically. After all, we've seen such stories crop up from time to time. But that Jeffries and the unscrupulous reporters very quickly jumped on it within the first few days, and that coverage expanded to such an extent, at least in part, because of their craven manipulations. This press manipulation, as that Times article shows, was never exactly a secret. Uh, Even though most cryptozoological accounts of the phenomenal week completely fail to mention it. But awareness of this manipulation has also led some skeptics to overstate its importance. When Jeffries died in 1933, the New York Times, apparently still not over it, published an obituary that named him as the originator of the so-called Jersey Devil hoax. Quote, his feature stunt was press agenting the reputed appearance in South Jersey communities of the Jersey Devil, a grotesque creature of his imagination. They seem to claim, in other words, that the Jersey Devil was always only an invention of Norman Jeffries. And you still encounter debunker-style Jersey Devil pieces today that repeat this perspective. There are plenty of accounts online that claim confidently that the Jersey Devil legend was entirely invented by Norman Jeffries in 1909. As we've seen, that's not true. Yeah, this is, this is Leeds erasure. <laughs> exactly. That's why I'm doing this show. <laughs> <laughs> but you could make the case that Jeffries was responsible for the monster's mutation. The phenomenal week and Jeffries' promotion and exaggeration of it can be seen as the moment when the Leeds Devil, a bit of local folklore, transformed into the Jersey Devil, as he was now increasingly being called, a nationally known cryptid, and one that now often looks suspiciously like a kangaroo. (laughs) The 
The Jersey Devil wasn't the only thing stalking the woods of the Pine Barrens in 1909. While there's no record of their having crossed paths with the beast during the phenomenal week, a psychologist named H.H. Goddard and his research assistant, Elizabeth Kite, were also tromping through those forests at that time. Sightings of Goddard, and especially Kite, would have been common to the Pine residents, as they often appeared unannounced, rapping on doors, and striking up conversations with people as they chopped wood, pumped water, or washed clothes. What were these suspicious interlopers, well-dressed and speaking in city accents, doing out in the Pine Barrens? Henry Herbert Goddard was a devout Quaker. Our old friends, the Society of Friends. The Quakers had never gone away since they played a leading role during the colonial period. They had simply become vastly outnumbered by all the other Europeans who poured into the continent and were now a tiny minority. Though we tend to think of Quakers as something from the past, there are still about 75,000 Quakers in the United States today, mostly still concentrated in their traditional capital, Philadelphia. Goddard was born on a farm in Maine in 1866. The youngest of five children, he was nine years old when his father died from injuries sustained when he was gored by one of his bulls. His mother then decided to become a traveling preacher, so young Henry Goddard was enrolled in a seminary. He received an Orthodox Quaker education, and upon graduating from a religious college in Pennsylvania as a young man, he decided to visit an older sister who was living in California. The western coast of the continent was becoming increasingly accessible to Euro-Americans at the time, and Goddard asked around for work in the fast-growing young towns of Oakland and Los Angeles. To his surprise, he was offered a job by the brand new University of Southern California in L.A. Goddard really wasn't qualified to be a professor, but the upstart new university in a young town was desperate for staff, so they had him teach <laughs> Latin, history, and botany, plus he coached the USC wow. football team. Hey, yeah, go Trojans. <laughs> Is that actually what they're called, or did you just make that up? I think they are. I'm 50 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, afterwards, with an inflated resume, he headed back east and eventually wound up as a professor of psychology in Pennsylvania. There, he caught the eye of Samuel Simeon Fells, a wealthy Philadelphia businessman who helped set him up with a new gig. H.H. H. Goddard was installed in 1906 as the director of the Vineland Training School for Feeble Minded Girls and Boys in oh, Vineland, New Jersey a town at the edge of the Pine Barrens. Yeah, whenever psychology in early 20th century comes up, it's just like walking on eggshells till you hit that. Yeah, so I think like before I go any further, I should probably offer a kind of a warning to our listeners here. Uh, the rest of this episode is going to deal with very outdated conceptions of psychology and disability. And we're, we're going to quote some of the terminology of the time and some of the things we're going to discuss might come off as shocking or insulting. And if this sounds like something that might be uh, uncomfortable for you to hear, you might want to check out of this episode now. Um, join us next week. You won't be missing anything essential for, for next episode if you feel like you'd rather skip something like that. So feeble-minded was a catch-all term for intellectual disability at the time, and the Vineland School was the world's first institute of its kind. With financial support by Samuel Simeon Fells, Goddard and his team were engaged to care for abandoned children showing signs of cognitive impairment or developmental issues, and they studied them. Goddard thought that he could get to the root of a problem afflicting American society, and the Institute's location near the Pine Barrens communities was seen as ideal. Remember, the Pineys, as people disparagingly called them, were widely viewed as degenerates. Goddard had fieldwork done both to locate children for his institute and to research the family histories of his subjects. Most of the actual legwork was done by his tireless assistant, Miss Kite, who tramped around sugar sand paths and petticoats to visit wooden shacks and conduct interviews. 
Goddard proposed some new terminology for describing people with intellectual disability, terms which are very familiar today, though not academically. He labeled people with the most severe intellectual impairments idiots. Uh, Those with the less extreme impairment were called imbeciles. Uh, Both of these terms existed to some extent before Goddard, but he popularized their use as intellectual categories. For individuals with the least severe, more borderline impairment, Goddard coined a new term, moron. Most of Goddard's research with Pine residents was carried out on what he called morons, people who were basically functional and could potentially hold down jobs, but who were nonetheless, to him, feeble-minded and of low moral character. While these categories were very influential, the good Quaker Goddard had been working on something else over at Vineland that would have an even bigger global impact. In 1897, the Vineland Center had adopted an eight-year-old girl whose real name would be unknown for decades. She was Emma Wolverton. Emma was born into an almshouse in the Pines before she wound up in the Vineland Center, where she was classified as a moron. H.H. Goddard took a special interest in Emma, observing her work and play while taking scrupulous notes. He wrote notes on her such as, can carry wood and fill a kettle, can throw a ball but cannot catch, sees and hears well, right-handed, excitable but not nervous, not affectionate and quite noisy, careless in dress, active, obstinate and destructive. Then he adds, a little chillingly, does not mind slapping and scolding. As he hovered over Emma, jotting notes about everything she did, he had Kite trace her family lineage through interviews conducted with Pine's residents. Goddard was working on a new theory, or rather an old theory, burnished by new science, that mental and moral deficiency were hereditary issues. Genealogy was cutting-edge science at the time. The Austrian abbot Gregor Mendel had done his pioneering research in heredity in pea plants in the 1850s and 60s, but his work had been ignored in his own time. It wasn't until the year 1900 that the scientific community was made aware of what we now call Mendelian genetics, and this dramatic rediscovery, seemingly unlocking the secret to how traits are inherited, revolutionized the field. Lots of people were eager to apply the lessons of Mendelian genetics wherever they could, including a New Jersey's Pine Barrens. One of those people was Elizabeth White, not to be confused with Goddard's assistant, Elizabeth Kite. Lizzie White was into berries. Cranberries were already a cash crop in the pines, but blueberries grew wild there too, and White, who had inherited a farm called Whitesbog in Burlington County, decided she wanted to use the latest science to grow them. She invited a fruit scientist named Dr. Frederick Coville to apply post-Mendelian theories and hired locals to work the crops, and Whitesbog began to produce the world's first cultivated blueberries. Hmm. The workers were so impressed by Elizabeth White's abilities to control her blueberry harvest that they told stories about how, when Miss White invited them into her house, They were each served one gigantic blueberry sitting in a dish of cream, which was to be cut in two with knife and fork. (laughs) It's a great example of the exaggerated storytelling traditions uh, of the Pine Barrens. It's based on a true thing. Surely we've all bought one of those clear plastic clamshells of big fat blueberries from the grocery store, which are so much bigger and fatter than wild blueberries. If you've ever checked where those were growing, there's a good chance they came from New Jersey, where the industry Miss White established still thrives. And even if they were growing in Chile or South Africa or whatever, those big fat cultivated berries are descendants of the fruit she bred. In fact, even that familiar packaging comes down to us from her. She was the first person to pack berries in clear cellophane so that they could be both protected against spilling while also being visible to admiring shoppers. But as for H.H. Goddard, he wasn't interested in applying Mendelian genetics to berries. Goddard was interested in people, or like 
the idea of people abstractly. And he, like many at the time, thought that the Mendelian laws were a master key that could be used to improve the human race. Little Emma, whom he obsessively hovered over, tossing her balls and making her so, represented the door he wanted to unlock. In 1912, Goddard published a book called The Kalakak Family. It told the story of an abandoned girl he called Deborah Kalakak. Kalakak was a surname that Goddard invented by combining the Greek words kalos and kakos, meaning good and bad. He said that he changed the girl's real name to protect her identity. Of course, Deborah Kalakak was actually Emma Wolverton. While including almost nothing about Emma's personality and none of her actual words, the book contains a bizarrely obsessive litany of specific details related to her, tracing a vague cold outline of the girl through a constellation of data points. He even records everything she asked for in her yearly letters to Santa Claus, starting in 1899 when she was 10 years old, without ever quoting her writing, but by listing the items like an inventory. 99. Book and harmonica. Double ought. Book, comb, paints, and doll. Ought one. Book, mittens, toy piano, handkerchief, Slate pencil. Ought two. Wax doll. Ribbon. Music box. Ought three. Postcards. Colored ribbons. Gloves and shears. Ought four. Trunk. Music box. Fairy tales. Games. Ribbons. Big doll. Ought five. Ribbons of different colors. Games. Handkerchiefs. Music box. Fairy tales. Ought six. Pair of stockings. Ribbons. Rubbers. Ought seven. Watch. Red ribbon. Brush and comb, paper. Ought eight, three yards of lawn, rubbers. Ought nine, nice shoes, pink, dark blue, and white ribbons. Ten, money for dentist bill. Eleven, rubbers, three shirts, blue scarf, three yards linen, two yards lawn for fancy work. By the time she was asking for a blue scarf, Emma was 22 years old. She had basically spent her whole life in this environment. Um, let's hear a little bit more from Goddard's book. This is a typical illustration of the mentality of a high-grade, feeble-minded person, the moron, the delinquent, the kind of girl or woman that fills our reformatories. They are wayward. They get into all sorts of trouble and difficulties, sexually and otherwise, and yet we have been accustomed to account for their defects on the basis of viciousness, environment, or ignorance. Rather good-looking, bright in appearance, with many attractive ways, the teacher clings to the hope, indeed insists, that such a girl will come out all right. Our work with Deborah convinces us that such hopes are delusions. Goddard wrote that, while he was observing his prized specimen, he and Elizabeth Kite had been tracing Deborah's family tree back to the American Revolution. And the family tree was, he claimed, the most definitive proof yet of the heredity of feeble-mindedness. The question is, how do we account for this kind of individual? The answer is, in a word, heredity, bad stock. We must recognize that the human family shows varying stocks or strains that are as marked and that breed as true as anything in plant or animal life. In the Kalakak family, Goddard describes what he says he learned about the family going back six generations. Apparently, Martin Kalakak was a man from a good family who enlisted to fight in the American Revolutionary War. While serving, his company stopped in a tavern in the Pine Barrens. There, he got loose and slept with a feeble-minded barmaid. While he apparently thought little of it, the barmaid would give birth to his child, while Martin settled down with a respectable woman after the war. All of the legitimate children of Martin Sr. married into the best families in their state, the descendants of colonial governors, signers of the Declaration of Independence, soldiers, and even the founders of a great university. Indeed, in this family and its collateral branches, we find nothing but good representative citizenship. As for the illegitimate child of the barmaid, from him have come 480 descendants. 143 of these, we have conclusive proof, were or are feeble-minded, 
while only 46 have been found normal. The rest are unknown or doubtful. There have been 33 sexually immoral persons, mostly prostitutes. There have been 24 confirmed alcoholics. There have been three epileptics. 82 died in infancy. Three were criminal. Eight kept houses of ill fame. Although Martin himself paid no further attention to the girl nor her child, society has had to pay the heavy price of all the evil he engendered. Goddard produced detailed diagrams of the two branches of the family, showing how the bad branch, which includes Deborah, continues to produce criminals, drunks, and prostitutes. Also, since uh, most members of both branches of the family have continued to live nearby in South Jersey, he states... Clearly, it was not environment that has made that good family. They made their environment. No amount of work in the slums or removing the slums from our cities will ever be successful until we take care of those who make the slums what they are. The environment, in other words, is irrelevant. It's all about humans having bad stocks and good stocks. The whole family was a living demonstration of the futility of trying to make desirable citizens from defective stock through making and enforcing compulsory education laws. So no matter what the bleeding hearts did or said, uh, this family, according to him, they would produce more feeble-minded children with which to clog the wheels of human progress. H.H. Goddard's book about the affliction besetting southern New Jersey became a bestseller and a sensation. By referencing the most cutting-edge new science and mustering a litany of facts, he appeared, in the eyes of many, to have settled the whole nurture-versus-nature thing once and for all. To him, there are genetic qualities that make people stupid, dangerous, and immoral, and they are what's holding the country back. In other words, places like the New Jersey Pine Barrens don't represent a failure of government, they represent the failure of the human stock you find there. The book was so popular that an attempt was made to turn it into a Broadway play, though it ultimately never got off the ground. It immediately became integrated into school curricula, and illustrated diagrams demonstrating the good and bad sides of the Kalakak family became a common sight in American classrooms. Even as late as 1977, NBC premiered a sitcom called The Calicacs, a Beverly Hillbilly-style show about a family of stupid Appalachians moving to California. Oh my god. So, what did Goddard want us to do about this problem he claimed to diagnose? Okay, exhausted SpongeBob here. (laughs) For the low-grade idiot, the loathsome unfortunate that may be seen in our institutions, some have proposed the lethal chamber. But humanity is steadily tending away from the possibility of that method, and there is no probability that it will ever be practiced. But in view of such conditions as are shown in the defective side of the Kalakak family, we begin to realize that the idiot is not our greatest problem. He is indeed loathsome. He is somewhat difficult to take care of. Nevertheless, He lives his life and is done. He does not continue the race with a line of children like himself. Because of this very low-grade condition, he never becomes a parent. It is the moron type that makes for us our great problem. And when we face the question, what is to be done with them, with such people as make up a large proportion of the bad side of the Kalakak family, we realize that we have a huge problem. His preferred solution to this huge problem is, and I quote, to take away from these people the power of procreation. He wants to sterilize them, though he fears that it won't be possible because non-scientists are too irrationally opposed to sterilization. According to him, as long as human sentiment and feeling are opposed to this practice, no amount of reasoning will avail. So recognizing how hard it would be to convince the public to accept this, Goddard advocated a program of segregation, but with a little strategic sterilization thrown in for good measure. He says that communities overrun by so-called feeble-minded people should be kept scrupulously separated from good, healthy societies so that the horror of Martin Kalakak sleeping with a barmaid is never repeated. 
If some people outside New Jersey had some vague idea of Pine's residence as drunk and stupid before this book was published, its popularity basically guaranteed that the public perception of the so-called Pineys would be fixed into a negative stereotype of a degenerate, grotesque population, a stereotype that continues in some form to this day. John McPhee in 1967 transcribed this exchange he had with a Pines denizen. People come here and say, we're looking for the Pineys, and I say, they're right here. And they say, no, we mean the people who live in caves and intermarry. If W.F. Myers and the writers facetiously reporting on the phenomenal week already felt they had cause to sneer at the Pines residents, by 1912, the whole country felt that they had been given permission not just to sneer at them, but to demand action, to insist that something be done about them. Some people tried. In the wake of Goddard's work, the New Jersey legislature passed a law that would have ordered the sterilization of morons in New Jersey, but it was later declared unconstitutional. In 1913, the governor of New Jersey, James Fairman Fielder, went on a tour of the Pine Barrens to assess the situation. Afterwards, he addressed reporters about what he saw, saying, The state must segregate them, that is certain and I think it may be necessary to sterilize some of them. This sterilization never ended up happening in the Pines, thankfully. But some other American communities weren't so lucky. Despite Goddard's regretful admission that the public probably wouldn't accept it, forced sterilization did actually take off in the United States. Actually, American eugenic sterilization had already started pre-Goddard, Indiana passed the world's first compulsory sterilization laws in 1907. Goddard's book gave the movement new steam, and various states began to pass laws that would result in over 64,000 Americans being forcibly sterilized between 1907 and 1963. Poor black women were particularly targeted by the eugenicist sterilization regimes in the continental United States. In Puerto Rico, Between the 1930s and 60s, nearly one-third of the island's entire female population was sterilized. And as recently as the 1970s, over 3,000 First Nations women were being sterilized in New Mexico, Arizona, Oklahoma, and South Dakota. As for H.H. Goddard, he was rewarded by the United States government for his work in 1913 when he was tasked with establishing a new intelligence testing program at Ellis Island. No way. He created tests that determined which immigrants were too feeble-minded to be allowed into the U.S. His tests, however, were not applied to people traveling first or second class, and were only applied to poorer passengers traveling steerage class. Also, he pre-selected his testing groups, allowing anyone whom he determined to be obviously mentally fit to pass through. Somehow, his tests determined that, in a random trial, 79% of Italians, 80% of Hungarians, and a whopping 83% of Jews trying to enter the country were feeble-minded. Which leads me to something that you might have seen coming by now. Goddard's study of the Pied Barrens residents may have had a huge impact in America, but it probably had its biggest impact in Germany. A German translation, Die Familie Kalkak, was given a huge printing backed by the ruling Nazi party in 1933. Hitler probably owned a personal copy. Both Goddard's study and the American sterilization regimes it inspired were very influential for the Nazis when they set up their extermination programs. Emma Wolverton, at age 25, was forced to move to a woman's institution across the street from the Vineland Institute. Goddard, now a world-famous scientist, though he had shown such obsessive clinical interest in Emma during the years she was in his care, never visited her and apparently never even inquired about her ever again. In the woman's institution, she was essentially forced into unpaid labor, which was the norm for underfunded state institutions at the time. She was forbidden to leave the building and forbidden to have contact with men. 
A couple times in her 20s, she managed to escape and have brief adventures before she was caught and brought back. But she soon resigned herself to the fact that she would spend the rest of her life within those walls. She worked hard as a child carer and as a seamstress, and during the Spanish flu outbreak, she was allowed to work as a nurse caring for the afflicted. She directed plays that the young children would perform while wearing costumes that she sewed for them, singing songs that she wrote, and she surely made the lives of countless institutionalized kids better by putting on these loving productions. At one point, she had a cat whom she named Henry, in honor of Henry Goddard, the man now totally absent from her life, towards whom she apparently bore no ill will. In 1978, not long after the Calacac sitcom was cancelled by NBC, she died in the institution after many years of caring for the kids there at the age of 89. It was just a couple years after her death that researchers looking into Goddard's work discovered that Emma Wolverton was the famous Deborah Calacac. Reviews of her case files offer no concrete evidence that Emma whose life was stolen from her and turned into a cautionary fable, ever required institutionalization in the first place. For many people in America in the 1910s, the so-called morons of the Pine Barrens were the real monsters. But... I hope that even if I hadn't brought up the connection to the Nazis, uh, everyone listening today can see that the actual real monster of the Pines was Goddard. He was the product of his time, sure, but even if his studies were perfectly rigorous and airtight, it's something is clearly very off, right? (laughs) By trying to apply the idea of hard science to humanity, he ended up landing on something terrifyingly inhuman. His attempts to use words rationally to sketch Emma's portrait show how chillingly misguided the technique is. And of course, there's a refusal to engage with issues of like access to education, proper nutrition, and social safety nets, all of it hand waved away with an unconvincing reference to how the the so-called good people inhabit the same general region. And reading his book, there are obviously subjective moral judgments leaking onto the page all over the place, especially in the rare occasions when he deigns to offer any access to his methodology for categorizing people. He's especially pearl-clutching about sex, and any kind of sexual adventurism or willingness to sleep around is seen as evidence of degeneracy by Goddard, when it kind of just reads like evidence of people having a good time. (laughs) Incidentally, it turns out that Goddard's study wasn't rigorous or airtight at all. Around the time Emma Wolverton died after a long life of patient unpaid labor, some researchers finally started to look more deeply into Goddard's work and discovered that it was full of bullshit. He had misrepresented and straight up invented so much of the Wolverton family history that his celebrated family trees, which had been endlessly reproduced and referenced in American textbooks and turned into diagrams hung on classroom walls, were revealed to be rubbish. The coup de grace on H. H. Goddard's tarnished legacy was delivered by Stephen Jay Gould, the beloved American paleontologist and scientific historian. Rest in power. Yeah. In 1981, he published a book called The Mismeasure of Man, where he contended that not only Goddard's book, but the whole American-led project of using science to justify the idea that intelligence is hereditary has been basically nothing but prejudice all along. It doesn't hold up unless you really want it to. So now let's return to where we started with that X-Files episode. (laughs) Pretty suspicious that their solution to the Jersey Devil mystery is a race of wild men and wild women, possibly less evolved than we are. I mean, equating the Jersey Devil with primitive pseudo-humans living in the woods doesn't seem like a random association anymore, does it? No, this is a pattern. 
Yeah, they they actually depict the real Jersey Devil as a young woman, uh, aboriginal in her savagery, as W.F. Myers would have put it, uh, a conceit that's kind of reminiscent of the way Goddard depicted Emma Wolverton. This incorporation of a city dweller's paranoia about fallen man is starting to feel like a core part of the Jersey Devil mythology. In fact, there are some strange overlaps between the nasty myth Goddard peddled and the Leeds Devil myth. He wrote that the unnamed barmaid that Martin Kallikak slept with, unleashing the horror of her brood upon the world, had 12 children, then, exhausted, had been killed by her 13th birth, just as the probably mythical Mother Leeds had been. As the X-Files episode shows, 20th century American stories about the devil always bore a whiff of this fearful condescension. Seen from the cities, the horror that was stalking those woods was people living differently, in a way that seemed insufficiently modern, frightening to prejudiced eyes. The real horror from a world historical perspective was Goddard and his sinister anti-human ideas, his reduction of lived lives to cold, creepy data points and listless words, and the narrow, overconfident moralist and ultimately murderous conclusions he reached. But what lingered in the public imagination was the suspicion of those woods dwellers, now known to be harboring a story that maybe enclosed some dark, significant secret that the scientists could never touch. H. H. Goddard, like Daniel Leeds's enemies, was a Quaker moralist. But those guys had clearly adapted since the colonial days. The strict arbiters of how people ought to live were now molded by the new American reality. They'd left behind the religious reformism and picked up on the obsession with scientific rationalism. This obsession hadn't abated since the days of Benjamin Franklin and his Enlightenment principles. If anything, it had only grown stronger, so strong that it defeated the soft-hearted love of wilderness, so strong that it overcame the sense of wonder and mystery that was always beckoning from the big wild spaces of a huge continent that was suddenly all accessible and available, unless you were one of its original inhabitants, in which case it was shrinking in the face of Euro-American encroachments powered by a soaring economy, capitalist depredation, and railroads. Wealthy, city-dwelling Americans loved the hammer of science so much, they wielded it against the holdouts, the people who continued to live in the woods and tell their evocative, surreal stories about how they choose to interpret the world. When the Leeds Devil reappeared in this new world, at the dawn of a new century. The scientific-minded new Americans hammered away at it as they hammered away at the disparaged people who had birthed it. If the Leeds Devil was going to survive deep into the 20th century, it was only going to be able to do so in a new form. The new century's Jersey Devil would have to become a cryptid. All right, we got a little heavy at the end there. Next episode's going to be a bit lighter, I promise you. <laughs> That's a strict no eugenics policy in the next one. <laughs> okay. I, can, I can agree to that. <laughs> I'm tapping the side. No eugenics this week. Yeah. So next week is going to be our final episode where we'll see what happened to the Jersey Devil in the mid and late 1900s, heading into the 21st century. We'll see how he was depicted in movies and TV. We'll learn about maverick filmmakers who tried to capture something essential about their country in unexpected ways. And zooming out, we'll learn about the birth of cryptozoology and ask the question, just why is America so obsessed with cryptids anyways? All right, I'm Dylan Ferguson. I'm Sean O'Rourke. Original music is by Rob Watt. Principal sources are going to be in the episode description. Next time for the conclusion of The Devil You Don't, we'll see you at the movies. (laughs) To quote the bard. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, that got me. I was wound up from all the uh, all the Nazi stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I warned you it was gonna get pretty grim at the end there. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe like how much stuff in history the devil gets into. He's got his grimy little hands all over the place. <laughs> <laughs>